The Defense of Socrates. Socrates adikei, tousteneus diaphtheron, kaitheus us hepolis nomisdei unomisdon, hetera de daimonia kaina. Inside the courthouse, a walled-in open space in which 501 representative citizens sit as the jury. Three Athenian citizens, Miletus, Anitus and Lycon, have brought a public action against Socrates as being a danger to society. The charge of impiety, of heresy against the gods, was intended to inflame prejudice, although Socrates was punctilious in his religious observances. The second and more serious charge was that Socrates corrupted the minds of the young. The target here was political. Some of Socrates' friends and disciples were right-wing aristocrats abhorred by the ruling Democratic Party. The prosecution also counted upon Socrates' unpopularity with those whose self-pride he had offended. They hoped that his uncompromising attitude would alienate the jury, which normally expected flattery and abject entreaties. According to court procedure, litigants had to state their own case without the help of counsel. The prosecution spoke first. And when the defendant had replied, the jury, without any guidance or summing up from the presiding magistrate, at once gave its verdict by a majority vote. Socrates is guilty of corrupting the minds of the young and of believing in deities of his own invention instead of the gods recognized by the state. I do not know what effect my accusers have had upon you, my fellow Athenians, but for my own part, I was almost carried away by them. Their arguments were so convincing. On the other hand, scarcely a word of what they said was true. I was especially astonished at one of their many misrepresentations. I mean that when they told you that you must be careful not to let me deceive you, the implication being that I am a skillful speaker, I thought that it was particularly brazen of them to tell you this without a blush, since they must know that they will soon be effectively confuted when it becomes obvious that I have not the slightest skill as a speaker. <laughs> Unless, of course, by a skillful speaker, they mean one who speaks the truth. If that is what they mean, I would agree that I am an orator, uh, though not after their pattern. My accusers, then, as I maintain, have said little or nothing that is true. But from me, you shall hear the whole truth. Not, I can assure you, in flowery language like theirs, decked out with fine words and phrases, no. What you will hear will be a straightforward speech in the first words that occur to me. Confident as I am in the justice of my cause, and I do not want any of you to expect anything different. It would hardly be suitable for a man of my age to address you in the artificial language of a schoolboy orator. One thing, however, I do most earnestly beg and entreat of you. If you hear me defending myself in the same language which it has been my habit to use, both in the open spaces of this city, where many of you have heard me, and elsewhere, do not be surprised. And do not interrupt. Let me remind you of my position. This is my first appearance in a court of law at the age of 70, and so I am a complete stranger to the language of this place. The proper course for me, members of the jury, is to deal first with the earliest charges that have been falsely brought against me, and with my earliest accusers, and then with the later ones. I make this distinction because I have already been accused in your hearing by a great many people for a great many years, though without a word of truth. And I am more afraid of those people than I am of Anitus and his colleagues, although they are formidable enough. 
But the others are still more formidable. I mean the people who took hold of so many of you when you were children and tried to fill your minds with untrue accusations against me, saying, there is a clever man called Socrates who has theories about the heavens and who has investigated everything below the earth and can make the weaker argument defeat the stronger. It is these people, my fellow citizens, the disseminators of these rumors who are my dangerous accusers, because those who hear them suppose that anyone who inquires into such matters must be an atheist. And the most fantastic thing of all is that it is impossible for me even to know and tell you their names, unless one of them happens to be a playwright. <laughs> All these people who have tried to set you against me out of envy and love of slander, and some too merely passing on what they've been told by others, all these are very difficult to deal with. It is impossible to bring them here for cross-examination. One simply has to conduct one's defense and argue one's case against an invisible opponent because there is no one to answer. Very well, then. I must begin my defense, my fellow Athenians. And I must try in the short time that I have to rid your minds of a false impression which is the work of many years. However, let that turn out as God wills. I must obey the law and make my defense. Let us go back to the beginning and consider what the charge is that has made me so unpopular and has encouraged Miletus to draw up this indictment. Very well. What did my critics say in attacking my character? I must read out their affidavits, so to speak, as though they were my legal accusers. Socrates is guilty of criminal meddling. In that, he inquires into things below the earth and in the sky and makes the weaker argument defeat the stronger and teaches others to follow his example. It runs something like that. You have seen it for yourself in the play by Aristophanes, where Socrates goes whirling around proclaiming that he is walking on air and uttering a great deal of other nonsense about things of which I know nothing whatsoever. I mean no disrespect for such knowledge if anyone really is versed in it. I don't want any more lawsuits brought against me by Miletus. <laughs> but the fact is that I take no interest in it. What is more, I call upon the greater part of you as witnesses to my statement, and I appeal to all of you who have ever listened to me talking, and there are a great many here to whom this applies, to clear your neighbors' minds on this point. Tell one another whether any one of you has ever heard me discuss such questions briefly or at length, and then you will realize that the other popular reports about me are equally unreliable. Well, here, perhaps, one of you might interrupt me and say, but what is it that you do, Socrates? How is it that you have been misrepresented like this? Well, this seems to me to be a reasonable request. <laughs> but perhaps some of you will think that I am not being serious, but I assure you that I am going to tell you the whole truth. I have gained this reputation from nothing more or less than a kind of wisdom what kind of wisdom do I mean? Well, human wisdom, I suppose. It seems that I really am wise in this limited sense. And now, gentlemen, please do not interrupt me if I seem to make an extravagant claim. For what I am going to tell you is not my own opinion. I am going to refer you to an unimpeachable authority. I shall call as witness to my wisdom, such as it is, the god at Delphi. You know Chirifon, of course. He was a friend of mine from boyhood and a good Democrat. And you know how enthusiastic he was over anything that he had once undertaken. Well, one day he actually went to Delphi and asked this question of the god. Whether there was anyone wiser than myself. The priestess replied that there was no one. Now please, consider my object in telling you this. I want to explain to you how the attack upon my reputation first started. 
When I heard about the oracle's answer, I said to myself, what does the God really mean? I am only too conscious that I have no claim to wisdom, great or small. So what can he mean by asserting that I am the wisest man in the world? Oh, he cannot be telling a lie. That would not be right for him. After puzzling about it for some time, I set myself at last, with considerable reluctance, to check the truth of it. I approached a man with a high reputation for wisdom, because I felt that here, if anywhere, I should succeed in disproving the oracle and pointing out to my divine authority, you said that I was the wisest of men, but here is a man <clears throat> who is wiser than I am. Well, I gave a thorough examination to this person. I need not mention his name, but it was one of our politicians that I was studying when I had this experience. And in conversation with him, I formed the impression that although in many people's opinion, and especially in his own, he appeared to be wise, in fact, he was not. <laughs> Then, when I began to try to show him that he only thought he was wise and was not really so, my efforts were resented, both by him and by many of other people present. However, I reflected as I walked away, well, I am certainly wiser than this man. It is only too likely that neither of us has any knowledge to boast of, but he thinks that he knows something which he does not know, whereas I am quite conscious of my ignorance. At any rate, it seems that I am wiser than he is to this small extent that I do not think that I know what I do not know. After this, I went on to interview a man with an even greater reputation for wisdom, and I formed the same impression again. And here, too, I incurred the resentment of the man himself and a number of others. From that time on, I interviewed one person after another. I realized with distress and alarm that I was making myself unpopular, but I felt compelled to put my religious duty first. Since I was trying to find out the meaning of the oracle, I was bound to interview everyone who had a reputation for knowledge. My honest impression was this. It seemed to me, as I pursued my investigation at the God's command, that the people with the greatest reputations were almost entirely deficient, while others who were supposed to be their inferiors were much better qualified in practical intelligence. I want you to think of my adventures as a sort of pilgrimage undertaken to establish the truth of the oracle once for all. After I had finished with the politicians, I turned to the poets, dramatic, lyric, and all the rest, in the belief that here I should expose myself as a comparative ignoramus. I used to pick up what I thought were some of their most perfect works and question them closely about the meaning of what they'd written, in the hope of incidentally enlarging my own knowledge. Well, I hesitate to tell you the truth, but it must be told. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that any of the bystanders could have explained those poems better than their actual authors. <laughs> so, I made up my mind about the poets too. I decided that it was not wisdom that enabled them to write their poetry, but a kind of instinct or inspiration, such as you find in seers and prophets who deliver all their sublime messages without knowing in the least what they mean. I also observed that the very fact that they were poets made them think that they had a perfect understanding of all other subjects of which they were totally ignorant. <laughs> so I left that line of inquiry too, with the same sense of advantage that I had felt in the case of the politicians. Last of all, I turned to the skilled craftsmen. I knew quite well that I had practically no technical qualifications myself, and I was sure that I should find them full of impressive knowledge. In this, I was not disappointed. They understood things which I did not, and to that extent, they were wiser than I was. But 
these professional experts seemed to share the same failing which I had noticed in the poets. I mean that on the strength of their technical proficiency, they claimed a perfect understanding of every other subject, however important. And I felt that this error more than outweighed their positive wisdom. So I made myself spokesman for the oracle and asked myself whether I would rather be as I was neither wise with their wisdom nor stupid with their stupidity or possess both qualities as they did. I replied through myself to the oracle that it was best for me to be as I was. <laughs> the effect of these investigations of mine has been to arouse against me a great deal of hostility and hostility of a particularly bitter and persistent kind which has resulted in various malicious suggestions, including the description of me as a professor of wisdom. This is due to the fact that whenever I succeed in disproving another person's claim to wisdom in a given subject, the bystanders assume that I know everything about that subject myself. But the truth of the matter is pretty certainly this, that real wisdom is the property of God. And this oracle is his way of telling us that human wisdom has little or no value. It seems to me that he is not referring literally to Socrates. He has merely taken my name as an example, as if he would say to us, the wisest of you men is he who has realized, like Socrates, that in respect of wisdom he is really worthless. That is why I still go about seeking and searching in obedience to the divine command. If I think that anyone is wise, whether citizen or stranger, and when I think that any person is not wise, I try to help the cause of God by proving that he is not. And this occupation has kept me too busy to do much either in politics or in my own affairs. In fact, my service to God has reduced me to extreme poverty. There is another reason for my being unpopular. A number of young men with wealthy fathers and plenty of leisure have deliberately attached themselves to me because they enjoy hearing other people cross-questioned. These often take me as their model and go on to try to question other persons, whereupon I suppose they find an unlimited number of people who think that they know something but really know little or nothing. Consequently, their victims become annoyed, not with themselves, but with me. And they complain that there is a pestilential busybody called Socrates, who fills these young people's heads with wrong ideas. If you ask them what he does, and what he teaches that has this effect, they have no answer, not knowing what to say. But as they do not want to admit their confusion, they fall back on the stock charges against any philosopher, that he teaches his pupils about things in the heavens and below the earth, and to disbelieve in gods, and to make the weaker argument defeat the stronger. He would be very loath, I fancy, to admit the truth, which is that they are entirely ignorant. So jealous, I suppose, for their own reputation, and also energetic and numerically strong, and provided with a plausible and carefully worked out case against me, these people have been dinning into your ears for a long time past their violent denunciations of myself. Well, there you have the true facts, which I present to you without any concealment or suppression, great or small. I'm fairly certain that this plain speaking of mine is the cause of my unpopularity. And this really goes to prove that my statements are true and that I have described correctly the nature and the grounds of the calumny which has been brought against me. Whether you inquire into them now or later, you will find the facts as I have just described them. <clears throat> so much for my defense against the charges brought by the first group of my accusers. I shall now try to defend myself against Miletus, 
high-principled and patriotic as he claims to be, and after that against the rest. Let us first consider their deposition again. As though it represented a fresh prosecution, it runs something like this. Socrates is guilty of corrupting the minds of the young and of believing in deities of his own invention instead of the gods recognized by the state. Such is the charge. Let us examine its points, one by one. First it says that I am guilty of corrupting the young. Tell me seriously, Miletus, is it better to live in a good or in a bad community? No. <laughs> oh, answer my question like a good fellow. There is nothing difficult about it. Is it not true that wicked people have a bad effect upon those with whom they are in the closest contact and that good people have a good effect? Quite true. Is there anyone who prefers to be harmed rather than benefited by his associates? Oh. Answer me, my good man. The law commands you to answer. Is there anyone who prefers to be harmed? Of course not. Well then, when you summon me before this court for corrupting the young and making their characters worse, do you mean that I do so intentionally or unintentionally? I mean intentionally. Yes. Why, Miletus, are you at your age so much wiser than I at mine? You have discovered that bad people always have a bad effect and good people a good effect upon their nearest neighbors. Am I so hopelessly ignorant as not even to realize that by spoiling the character of one of my companions I shall run the risk of getting some harm from him? Because nothing else would make me commit this grave offense intentionally. No, I do not believe it, Miletus, and I do not suppose that anyone else does. Either I have not a bad influence or it is unintentional, so that in either case, your accusation is false. And if I unintentionally have a bad influence, the correct procedure in cases of such involuntary misdemeanors is not to summon the culprit before this court, but to take him aside privately for instruction and reproof. Because, obviously, if my eyes are opened, I shall stop doing what I do not intend to do. But you deliberately avoided my company in the past and refused to enlighten me. And now you bring me before this court, which is the place appointed for those who need punishment, not for those who need enlightenment. It is quite clear by now, members of the jury, that Miletus, as I said before, has never shown any degree of interest in this subject. However, I invite you to tell us, Miletus, in what sense you make out that I corrupt the minds of the young. Surely the terms of your indictment made it clear that you accuse me of teaching them to believe in new deities instead of the gods recognized by the state. Is not that the teaching of mine which you say has this demoralizing effect? That is precisely what I maintain. Then I appeal to you, Miletus, in the name of these same gods about whom we are speaking, to explain yourself a little more clearly to myself and to the jury, because I cannot make out what your point is. Is it that I teach people to believe in some gods, which implies that I myself believe in gods and am not a complete atheist, so that I am not guilty on that score? but in different gods from those recognized by the state, so that your accusation rests upon the fact that they are different? Or do you assert that I believe in no gods at all and teach others to do the same? Yes. I say that you disbelieve in gods altogether. Yes. You surprise me, Miletus. What is your object in saying that? Do you suggest that I do not believe that the sun and moon are gods, as is the general belief of all mankind? He certainly does not, members of the jury, since he says that the sun is a stone and the moon a mass of earth. My dear Miletus, have you so poor an opinion of these people? And do you assume them to be so illiterate as not to know that the writings of Anaxagoras are full of theories like these? And do you seriously suggest that it is from me that the young get these ideas when they can buy them on occasion in the marketplace for a drachma at most? 
and so have the laugh on Socrates if he claims them for his own, to say nothing of their being so silly. Tell me honestly, Miletus, do I believe in no god? No, none at all, not in the slightest degree. You are not at all convincing, Miletus, not even to yourself, I suspect. As a matter of fact, I do not feel that it requires much defense to clear myself of Miletus's accusation. What I have said already is enough. But you know very well the truth of what I said in an earlier part of my speech, that I have incurred a great deal of bitter hostility. And this is what will bring about my destruction, if anything does. Not Miletus, nor Anitus, but the slander and jealousy of a very large section of the people. They have been fatal to a great many other innocent men, and I suppose will continue to be so. There is no likelihood that they'll stop at me. But perhaps someone will say, do you feel no compunction, Socrates, at having followed a line of action which puts you in danger of the death penalty? I might fairly reply to him, you are mistaken, my friend. If you think that a man who is worth anything ought to spend his time weighing up the prospects of life and death, he has only one thing to consider in performing any action. That is whether he is acting rightly or wrongly, like a good man or a bad one. On your view, the heroes who died at Troy would be poor creatures. The truth of the matter is this. Where a man has once taken up his stand, either because it seems best for him or in obedience to his orders, there I believe he is bound to remain and face the danger, taking no account of death or anything else before dishonor. This being so, it would be shocking inconsistency on my part if, when God appointed me, as I suppose and believe, to the duty of leading the philosophic life, examining myself and others, I were then, through fear of death or of any other danger, to desert my post. That would indeed be shocking. And then I might really, with justice, be summoned into court for not believing in the gods, and disobeying the oracle, and being afraid of death and thinking that I am wise when I am not. It is my belief that no greater good has ever befallen you in this city than my service to my God. For I spend all my time going about trying to persuade you, young and old, to make your first and chief concern not for your bodies, nor for your possessions, but for the highest welfare of your souls. I'm going to tell you something else. I do not believe that the law of God permits a better man to be harmed by a worse. No doubt my accuser might put me to death or have me banished or deprived of civic rights. But even if he thinks, as he probably does, and others too, I dare say, that these are great calamities, I do not think so. I believe that it is far worse to do what he is doing now, trying to put an innocent man to death. For this reason, so far from pleading on my own behalf, as might be supposed, I am really pleading on yours to save you from misusing the gift of God by condemning me. If you put me to death, you will not easily find anyone to take my place. It is literally true, even if it sounds rather comical, that God has specially appointed me to this city as though it were a large thoroughbred horse, which because of its great size is inclined to be lazy and needs the stimulation of some stinging fly. It seems to me that God has attached me to this city to perform the office of such a gadfly. And all day long I never cease to settle here, there and everywhere, rousing, persuading, reproving every one of you. You will not easily find another like me. And if you take my advice, you will spare my life. Yes. 
Does it seem curious that I should go around giving advice like this and busying myself in people's private affairs and yet never venture publicly to address you as a whole and advise on matters of state? The reason for this is what you have often heard me say before on many other occasions, that I am subject to a divine or supernatural experience which Miletus saw fit to travesty in his indictment. It began in my early childhood, a sort of voice which comes to me. And when it comes, it always dissuades me from what I am proposing to do and never urges me on. It is this that debars me from entering public life and a very good thing too, in my opinion. Because you may be quite sure that if I had tried long ago to engage in politics, I should long ago have lost my life without doing any good either to you or to myself. Now please, do not be offended if I tell you the truth. No man on earth who conscientiously opposes either you or any other organized democracy and flatly prevents a great many wrongs and illegalities from taking place in the state to which he belongs can possibly escape with his life. The true champion of justice, if he intends to survive, even for a short time, must necessarily confine himself to private life and leave politics alone. You will find that throughout my life I have been consistent in any public duties that I have performed, and the same also in my personal dealings. I have never countenanced any action that was incompatible with justice on the part of any person, including those whom some people maliciously call my pupils. I have never set up as any man's teacher. But if anyone, young or old, is eager to hear me conversing and carrying out my private mission, I never grudge him the opportunity. Nor do I charge a fee for talking to him refusing to talk without one. I am ready to answer questions for rich and poor alike, and I am equally ready if anyone prefers to listen to me and answer my questions. If any given one of these people becomes a good citizen or a bad one, I cannot fairly be held responsible, since I have never promised or imparted any teaching to anybody. And if anyone asserts that he has ever learned or heard from me privately anything which was not open to everyone else, you may be quite sure that he is not telling the truth. But how is it that some people enjoy spending a great deal of time in my company? You have heard the reason, I told you quite frankly. It is because they enjoy hearing me examine those who think that they are wise when they are not an experience which has its amusing side. This duty I have accepted, as I said, in obedience to God's commands given in oracles and dreams and in every other way that any other divine dispensation has ever impressed a duty upon man. This is a true statement and easy to verify. I leave it to you and to God to judge me as it shall be best for me and for yourselves. Crisis tu demu. Adikei, Socrates.
The 501 members of the jury have now voted. 221 voted for acquittal, 280 for conviction. Socrates has therefore been found guilty. When the verdict was guilty, and as in the present case there was no fixed penalty, the plaintiff proposed one, the defendant another, and the jury then voted between the two proposals. Miletus proposed the penalty of death. Stemia thanatos. There are a great many reasons, my fellow Athenians, why I'm not distressed by this result. I mean, your condemnation of me. But the chief one is that the result was not unexpected. What does surprise me is the number of votes cast on the two sides. I should never have believed that it would be such a close thing. However, we must face the fact that Miletus demands the death penalty. Very good. What alternative penalty shall I propose to you, members of the jury? Obviously, it must be adequate. Well, what penalty do I deserve to pay or suffer in view of what I've done? I have never lived an ordinary quiet life. I did not care for the things that most people care about. Making money, having a comfortable home, high military or civil rank, and all the other activities which go on in our city. I thought that I was really too strict in my principles to survive if I went in for this sort of thing. So, I set myself to do you individually, in private, what I hold to be the greatest possible service. I tried to persuade each of you not to think more of practical advantages than of his mental and moral well-being. Or in general, to think more of advantage than of well-being in the case of the state or of anything else. What do I deserve for behaving in this way? Some reward, if I am bound to suggest what I really deserve. And what is more, a reward which would be appropriate for myself. Well, what is appropriate for a poor man who is a public benefactor and who requires leisure for giving you moral encouragement? Nothing could be more appropriate for such a person than free maintenance at the state's expense. <laughs> or perhaps when I say this, I may give you the impression that I am showing a deliberate perversity. That is not so. The real reason is this. I am convinced that I never wrong anyone intentionally. But I cannot convince you of this because we have had so little time for discussion. It is not easy to dispose of grave allegations in a short space of time. So being convinced that I do no wrong to anybody, I can hardly be expected to wrong myself by asserting that I deserve something bad or by proposing a corresponding penalty. Why should I? For fear of suffering this penalty proposed by Miletus, when, as I said, I do not know whether it is a good thing or a bad, do you expect me to choose something which I know very well is bad by making my counter-proposal? Imprisonment? Why should I spend my days in prison? A fine with imprisonment until it is paid? In my case, the effect would be just the same because I have no money to pay a fine. Or shall I suggest... Punishment. You would very likely accept the suggestion, but I should have to be desperately in love with life to accept that. I am not so blind that I cannot see that you, my fellow citizens, have come to the end of your patience with my discussions and conversations. You have found them too irksome and irritating, and now you are trying to get rid of them. Will any other people find them easy to put up with? That is most unlikely. A fine life I should have if I left this country at my age and spent the rest of my days trying one city after another and being turned out every time. I know very well that wherever I go, 
The young people will listen to my conversation just as they do here. And if I try to keep them off, they will make their elders drive me out. While if I do not, the fathers and other relatives will drive me out of their own accord for the sake of the young. Perhaps someone will say, but surely, Socrates, after you've left us, you can spend the rest of your life in quietly minding your own business. This is the hardest thing of all to make some of you understand. If I say that this would be disobedience to God, and that is why I cannot mind my own business, you will not believe that I am serious. If, on the other hand, I tell you that to let no day pass without discussing goodness and all the other subjects about which you hear me talking and examining both myself and others is really the very best thing that a man can do and that life without this sort of examination is not worth living, you will be even less inclined to believe me. Nevertheless, that is how it is, as I maintain. No, oh, it is not easy to convince you of it. Besides, I am not accustomed to think of myself as deserving punishment. I suppose I could probably afford a, a hundred drachmas. <laughs> I suggest a fine of that amount. Socrates, I'll put up a thousand, and Crito is willing to put up another thousand. Yes, Socrates, a thousand from me, too, and the same from me. Now, one moment, please. Please. These friends of mine, Plato here, and Crito, and Critobulus, and Apollodorus, want me to propose three thousand drachmas on their security. Very well, I agree to this sum. And you can rely upon these gentlemen for its payment. Crisis to demo. Demia Thanatos. Five hundred and one members of the jury now cast their votes again. Apparently eighty more than had found him guilty now favoured death. So three hundred and sixty voted for the death penalty and only a hundred and forty-one for the fine. Stemia. Well, members of the jury, if you had waited just a little longer, you would have had your way in the course of nature. You can see that I am well on in life and near to death. I am saying this not to all of you, but to those who voted for my execution. And I have something else to say to them as well. No doubt you think, sirs, that I have been condemned for lack of the arguments which I could have used if I had thought it right to leave nothing unsaid or undone to secure my acquittal. But that is very far from the truth. It is not my lack of arguments that has caused my condemnation, but my lack of effrontery and impudence. 
In a court of law, justice in warfare, neither I nor any other ought to use his wits to escape death by any means. The difficulty is not so much to escape death. The real difficulty is to escape from doing wrong, which is far more fleet of foot. In this present instance, I, the slow old man, have been overtaken by the slower of the two. But my accusers, who are clever and quick, have been overtaken by the faster, by iniquity. When I leave this court, I shall go away condemned by you to death. But they will go away convicted by truth herself of depravity and wickedness. And they accept their sentence even as I accept mine. No doubt it was bound to be so. And I think that the result is fair enough. Having said so much, I feel moved to prophesy to you who have given your vote against me. For I am now at that point where the gift of prophecy comes most readily to men. At the point of death. I tell you, my executioners, that as soon as I am dead, vengeance shall fall upon you with a punishment far more painful than your killing of me. You have brought about my death in the belief that through it you will be delivered from submitting your conduct to criticism. But I say that the result will be just the opposite. You will have more critics whom up till now I have restrained without your knowing it. And being younger, they will be harsher to you and will cause you more annoyance. If you expect to stop denunciation of your wrong way of life by putting people to death, there is something amiss with your reasoning. This way of escape is neither possible nor creditable. The best and easiest way is not to stop the mouths of others but to make yourselves as good men as you can. This is my last message to you who voted for my condemnation. As for you who voted for my acquittal, I should very much like to say a few words to reconcile you to the result. While the officials are busy and I am not yet on my way to the place where I must die, I ask you, gentlemen, to spare me these few moments. There is no reason why we should not exchange fancies while the law permits. I look upon you as my friends, and I want you to understand the right way of regarding my present position. Gentlemen of the jury, for you deserve to be so called, I have had a remarkable experience. In the past, the prophetic voice to which I have become accustomed has always been my constant companion, opposing me even in quite trivial things if I was going to take the wrong course. Now, something has happened to me, as you can see, which might be thought and is commonly considered to be a supreme calamity. Yet neither when I left home this morning, nor when I was taking my place here in the court, nor at any point in any part of my speech, did the divine sign oppose me. Death is one of two things. Either it is annihilation and the dead have no consciousness of anything, or as we are told, it is really a change a migration of the soul from this place to another. Now, if there is no consciousness but only a dreamless sleep, death must be a marvelous gain. I suppose that if anyone were told to pick out the night on which he slept so soundly as not even to dream, and then to compare it with all the other nights and days of his life, and then we're told to say, after due consideration, how many better and happier days and nights than this he had spent in the course of his life. Well, I think that he would find these days and nights easy to count in comparison with the rest. If death is like this, then 
I call it gain. Because the whole of time, if you look at it in this way, can be regarded as no more than one single night. If, on the other hand, death is a removal from here to some other place, and if what we are told is true, that all the dead are there, what greater blessing could there be than this, gentlemen? If, on arrival in the other world, beyond the reach of our so-called justice, one will find there the true judges who are said to preside in those courts, would that be an unrewarding journey? How much would one of you give to meet Orpheus and Homer? It would be a specially interesting experience for me to join them there. You too, gentlemen of the jury, must look forward to death with confidence and fix your minds on this one belief which is certain, that nothing can harm a good man either in life or after death. And his fortunes are not a matter of indifference to the gods. This present experience of mine has not come about mechanically. I am quite clear that the time had come when it was better for me to die and be released from my distractions. That is why my sign never turned me back. For my own part, I bear no grudge at all against those who have condemned me and accused me, although it was not with this kind intention that they did so, but because they thought that they were hurting me, and that is culpable of them. However, I ask them to grant me one favor. When my sons grow up, if you think that they are putting money or anything else before goodness, take your revenge by plaguing them as I plagued you. And if they fancy themselves for no reason, you must scold them just as I scolded you for neglecting the important things and thinking that they are good for something when they are good for nothing. If you do this, I shall have had justice at your hands. Both I myself and my children. <clears throat> now it is time that we were going. I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God. <laughs> 